Well, welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon special program at the East Side Freedom Library, or I guess I should say, put quotation marks around at. Um, I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director. Um, I should warn you that we are recording this event and given the advanced publicity, I'm sure that the FBI is recording it as well. Um, so you wanna be aware of that before you say anything. Um, the plan for the day, uh, we're honoring and engaging our old friend, Fran Shore, um, who has written his first novel, uh, Passages in Rebellion, uh, which is a look at the anti-war student activist movement at the University of Minnesota in the late 60s. Um, and our plan today is, uh, Fran is gonna say a little bit about the book um, we then have enlisted three readers, um, and they are Bill Tilton, who many of you probably know, um, who, as we say, Bill was there, um, and Bill has had a long career as a progressive attorney uh, in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota. And then we will hear from Charlotte Calanti, who is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and now a community organizer for the West Side Citizens Organization uh, on the west side of St. Paul. And then we will hear from Sidney Carlson White, who is a current undergraduate at Yale University and an activist in progressive politics there. Although just to promote, Sid is actually at, without quotation marks, at the East Side Freedom Library, that gorgeous background. Um, but our plan is that uh, each of these discussants uh, will make some comments, perhaps raise some questions. Fran will have a few minutes to respond. Then we will invite all of you in the audience uh, to type in, in the chat function, comments and questions, which I will be tracking and passing along to Fran and to the discussants. There will be a parallel process going on on our Facebook page. Um, there are probably people out there uh, in the ether world uh, watching today on Facebook. They too will be able to pose comments and questions. Um, after we've done a bit of that, um, we will go, we will unlock everybody's screen. You can all show yourselves. Uh, you can all unmute your microphones and you can cross talk uh, to each other, um, whatever it is that might inspire you. So um, that is the plan for the day. Um, I have had the good fortune of knowing Fran, um, I bet for 20 odd years, maybe even more um, through my annual presence at the North American Labor History Conference in Detroit, where Fran has been a regular presence all these years. And, um, and I was just delighted that he reached out um, with, with his first novel. Um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Fran and hopefully this will run smoothly uh, henceforth. Please stay muted. Um, if you're like me, you have a dog in the background who might bark at any unpredictable time, better to be muted. Fran. All right, um, thank you. Um, can everybody see me now? Great. Um, well, first of all, uh, just welcome to everybody. I'm really excited about this. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a delight to try reconnect with people. Um, so I want to do some shout outs during the time that I have. Uh, and maybe, as Pete said, we'll have the cross discussion uh, later in the session. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank Pete for having this. Thank the respondents, uh, Bill, Charlotte, and Sid. Uh, thank Carla for helping to set this up. Um, thank the ESL for being, uh, ESFL for being there uh, all these years, which has been wonderful. And to all the uh, past and uh, present activists who are going to be part of this discussion. Um, so uh, let me, uh, I was encouraged to try to start a, um, um, a 
you know, do some screen sharing of uh, my, uh, uh, so you didn't have to look at my face all this time. Uh, so the, the first thing is, um, again, uh, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna encourage people to, uh, if you are gonna read the book, not to use Amazon, uh, you can go to the outskirts press to buy it or let me know and I'll send you an electronic copy of it or to anybody you want to so you can you can have it for free. So what I want to try to do in the limited time that I have is do three things, highlight the motivations for why I wrote this, talk about what the sources have been, and then uh, also uh, discuss, um, let's see if I can get this to go. Uh, um, I need to try to move my screen saver um, and also continue on with the slideshow. Anybody have any ideas how that, oh, there we go. All right, all right. All right, so here we go. Um, so uh, my sources, um, uh, I started writing this at the end of March uh, in, of this year, 2020. Uh, actually, um, my father had just, my 100 year old father had just passed away. Um, you know, one gets to a certain point in one's life where you start taking what Gramsci used to say, an inventory, an inventory of your life. And this is part of that self-reflection. Um, also, you know, the coronavirus hit uh, and um, many of us were beginning the process of, of locking down and shutting in. And so I thought, what better way to escape from the, the entombed sense that I had and by using my uh, imagination to, to try to <laughs> reconstruct what was going on at a particular uh, poignant uh, moment in my life and the lives of so many people and many of you who are here today. And then finally, I had just finished another manuscript and I'd submitted it to uh, an academic press, which takes forever and it's such a painful process that I thought I gotta divert myself from worrying about that. So those were the, the, the basic um, motivations. Um, and uh, so I wanna talk now about the sources um, for this. And I'm, I'm just having a little, there we go. Okay. So um, my sources were the most fallible source was of course my memory. And I apologize uh, to those who, uh, did not make an appearance <laughs> in the fictionalized uh, past, but because I uh, couldn't uh, conjure up everybody's name or image. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, people have contacted me now, uh, particularly in that photograph you see on the left-hand side of my hirsute self, uh, addressing people on the University of Minnesota campus in 1967. Thank you, Howie Schneider, for that. I have very, very, I hardly have any photographs from that period. I rue the fact that I never kept a journal. Uh, um, I did have to go back, and as you can see, I grabbed some um, old Minneapolis Star Tribune, some, some of the archival material, and that's the way I tried to reconstruct the past. There's my clean cut self. Um, I don't know if you can just make that out uh, with uh, my then wife, Peggy, who is the, the fictionalized Mary Brown. Um, and uh, that's the clean cut protester that they re refer to on January 15th, 1968, when I refused induction at the, um, uh, the induction center in downtown Minneapolis. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I thought about at one point, maybe making this a, a memoir um, and realized that, uh, you know, I really didn't want this to be uh, a memoir. So anyhow, um, so this is, this is um, taking a look at the historical record, uh, reading a, a lot of over the years, there's wonderful books. We can talk more about those later, those, um, um, uh, images that I think come up, uh, you know, there are a lot of historical facts. The March on the Pentagon was for pretty much, um, you know, a fact. Uh, I mean, I used uh, uh, almost verbatim my own letter to the um, draft board and my, when I handed out that leaflet at the induction center on the day I refused induction, that was also, um, also almost verbatim. Um, so that's part of the historical record. And then what I wanted to do, there were a series of 
at the time and still to this day, there's certain ideas that continue to animate my sense of what happens in the world. And I wanted those ideas foregrounded in this novel because I felt and I still feel that, that some of these people in particular play a role in our understanding the role of violence. Uh, in this case, Albert Camus and the role of state violence, uh, James Baldwin, the role of white supremacist violence, and Andrea Dworkin in the role of patriarchal violence. And so that's a, those are threads that run um, throughout uh, the novel, um, the animating ideas. And of course, I also, uh, just for the hell of it, <laughs> I thought, why not give it another layer? Uh, and this was the case of adding these literary allusions to Tolkien, uh, and to the Lord of the Rings. And I must admit that I had a hard time making it through the Lord of the Rings, but I didn't have a hard time making it through the movie. So um, the characters, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with the Lord of the Rings and with the particular characters, uh, the main uh, TCDAC characters, in fact, are characters right out of Lord of the Rings. I sort of inflect them that way. Um, Okay, so here are the plot. Um, uh, there are, in addition to the um, to those uh, those particular characters, um, and we can talk more about them. Um, I invented certain characters because I felt, uh, still, as I think most of us do, uh, what has animated our recent time has been uh, the fallout from the murder of George Floyd and uh, the mobilization uh, continuing around Black Lives Matter. So I wanted to put in two characters who I made up who were uh, Jamal and Lamar Rice. Uh, and that was very, very specific to the character of Tamar Rice. Um, uh, of course, the moment I, I invented these characters and invented the time uh, the Dinky Town occupation did not result in anybody being killed. It did result in the cops beating up a bunch of people. Um, but I, I needed to have that in there along with this um, mysterious plot, uh, the mysterious stranger. This is a real character. Leo Burt was one of the uh, uh, James gang, as they were called, who was responsible for the uh, blast of the Army Math Research Center. Bert was on the Daily Cardinal, uh, and Leo Bert, by the way, disappears, never found by the FBI. Initially, he was thought to have been the uh, Unabomber. <laughs> um, anyhow, so that was a character who I sort of built on a little bit. Um, uh, and then, of course, I, fl I flash forward uh, because I wanted to keep this uh, as as um, relevant as possible and wanted to see the generational passages of rebellion. And to this, I added the character of Ruth Brown, who's a composite of my three daughters. I can talk more about that, Molly, Miriam, and, and Emma. And uh, they're all feminists, but they're all different kinds of feminists. And uh, with the youngest, Finn being uh, taking on a new name, gender uh, fluid, um, more we can talk about that too. Um, and then finally, I felt it was really important um, to bring this uh, up to date, even though the epilogue is a uh, short circuiting of so much of what probably Sid and Charlotte can um, bring to this conversation. But you'll recognize these demonstrations that occurred in Minneapolis uh, around uh, Jam uh, Jamar Clark and Philandro uh, Castile. And uh, that's um, so that's my time. Um, and uh, uh, I look forward to our discussion. I'm done <laughs> for now. No, it's Bill is up. Okay. Okay, I was I was waiting for you, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, hi there. I'm Bill. Um, and um, I saw this as a memoir, Fran. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's easier to write a novelized memoir because then you can invent language of Dave Pence talking with Dave Gutnick and Sandy Wilkinson and other people at the Draft Information Center in a way that a memoir would not. Right. But, but otherwise, I really appreciated 
that it was historical. I learned so much about you because I, I, I assumed that, that the, the history of Fran Goodman was the history of Fran Shore. And I'm, I'm a little bit jealous because you were involved uh, a couple of years before I was in the anti-war movement. And, and uh, I, I just loved it. I, I, I wish I'd known you were in Detroit all this time because mm. I did my prison time near Detroit. Yeah, in Milan. Dear, a dear friend started a Michigan nonprofit because of, and for that reason, I've owned inner city Detroit property for 35 years mm. and, and get there. I used to get there once a month. Um, and so uh, that, that was a missed opportunity. I wanna to return to the book though. I, I, and I have uh, to free associate a little bit because I wanna to apologize to everybody. I can't find my book. I read it immediately upon receiving it from Peter. I had favorite passages and, and uh, 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 passages to give you grief about all carefully marked, pages folded to go to and this, that, and everything. I, I don't know where my book is. I spent an hour looking around my house. I, 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 I learned corners of my house I'd forgotten about, but I can't find the book. Um, but but uh, for those, I, I would assume most people listening have read it um, if, if, if I'm going to hold off on one question because it, it's otherwise a bit of a spoiler alert, but I have a question for Fran. Um, uh, in any case, um, I, I love the Tolkien references. This is again personalizing it because I read all of the Hobbit book and the three Lord of the Rings <laughs> books to my daughters. I have three daughters. It took two or three years, um, but, but it, it's all a part of uh, of uh, the Tilton family uh, uh, gestalt. And, and so that was a wonderful thing to, to read. Um, I, I, what I was reminded of is not just that this was an important part of American history and an important part of our lives. It was such a maturing part of our lives, such a definitive part that is, I think, uh, defined who we are today in so many ways that so many events of other people at that time did not. Um, I am reminded, and we can blow our own horn, we did shit. We were involved in, in, in the issues of our time. And, and I, I appreciate the book for reminding me of that aspect that, that you know, I, I, I see Barry Cohen and Chuck Kerchick and, and, and Frank and Howie and other people are, are with us. We did shit and we can be proud of that. And, and I, I thank Fran for reminding us of that and, and for bringing us all, all, all together. Um, uh, of course, Marv Davidoff, we can see our Himmelman, you know, and some of the others there. I, 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 I hope Chuck Turchick gets involved in the discussion. Uh, he, he was there at the creation of so many other things. Um, I, I love the Liberty House stuff. Liberty House was such a vibrant place. For those of you who don't know, it was at 6th and Cedar in, in Minneapolis. Marv Davidoff had uh, most of the first floor for uh, selling goods from the Delta of Mississippi. And on the second floor was the Draft Information Center and 100 Flowers and, and um, so many other things that sort of uh, just needed a, a workspace. It was, it was early WeWork. Anybody could sort of come and, and have a space and, and do things there. That was uh, the Honeywell Project and, and, and other things. It, it was a, a vital time and it's so, wonderful to have things uh, reminded uh, uh, that you did. Uh, to the extent you mentioned you don't have many photos. I had a ton of photos. Uh. I have uh, 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 boxes and boxes of crap from student government or stupid government, whatever you want to call it, uh, from the new mob, from, from uh, the liberation coalition. If, if some of those things ring bells, I, I had like 15 or 18 boxes. I gave them to the University of Minnesota Anderson Library. So if anybody's interested in doing more research on, on these issues, 
Peter, I sent you some examples. You didn't have, have time to utilize them for this. Um, I, 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 I just have a ton of material and, and, and Anderson Library at the University of West Bank would be happy to share them. Um, the, the only criticism I have, Fran, is my memories of those times included more sex, drugs, rock and roll than you put into the book. <laughs> but I can understand why maybe you did not. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and with that, I think my five minutes are up. And uh, um, thank you. Thank you for including me here. Thank you, Bill. And maybe we'll get to the sex and drugs and rock and roll in the wider discussion period um, when we turn off the recording. <laughs> uh, so Charlotte, you're next. All right. Thank you, Phil. First, I just want to thank Peter for inviting me to be part of this conversation and for the library to continue to put on these kind of events, even during a pandemic, even we're all in our different places. And also, Fran, thank you for writing this book. I, I found it so insightful and really so delightful to read. I went to the University of Minnesota about 50 years after the events in this book are described, but I also have been to Al's Diner also went to the West Bank all the time, also have been in all these buildings. So I really found it so rich and so valuable to remember the activist history that went on in those buildings. Um, and I was just really grateful for the uh, opportunity to be reminded and to learn about these things. So thank you. Thanks. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about and comment on is Frank's character is coming from a Quaker perspective from a summer working, um, from a Quaker house, I think, in the anti-draft, anti-war movement. And then through the book, the character's relationship to nonviolence and his commitment to nonviolence is sort of challenged and tested, um, particularly after the assassination of Martin Luther King and the uprisings in the wake of that. And I was wondering if you could speak more about your relationship to nonviolence throughout in this period of your life and also since then and what does it mean to be nonviolent? And what is, what's its power and what are its limits under white supremacy and in a political life that is so saturated in violence? Mm -hmm. So I was really curious about that distinction. And as the movement becomes more militant, um, how did your relationship to that change? Yeah. Um, the second question I wanted to ask was about the relationship between Mary and Frank. And Mary's often bemoaning Frank's martyr complex. Um, why do you have to do this? Um, and so I was kind of curious if you could speak to that from your personal experience. And um, it seems to be the one of the factors, at least in the demise of the relationship. And I, I think it brings up a really interesting question around what is the role of the individual within a social movement? And how does your relationship to yourself change as being part of a movement? I think movements rely on you know, really extreme bravery from individual people. But on the other hand, how does that devolve into egoism or kind of martyrdom or sense of over self importance? Mm -hmm. And this kind of brings me to a question around gender and the anti-draft movement, anti-war movement in this rendering is really male dominated, mm -hmm. right? And so what was it like to be involved in organizing in a really, in a space dominated by, by young men? Um, how did you see the patriarchy play out? What do you think were the limitations that that brought? And I was so curious by kind of the intervention that these characters of Eileen and then Ruth Brown make at the end, bringing more radical feminist perspective. And how does that change Frank's understanding of himself? How does that kind of shed light on the patriarchal impulses of, of movement organizing in the 60s? Um, so, I have a lot of questions. I thought this was an incredible book. Um, but my last question was kind of you write about that after LBJ does not seek domination again, and these broader trends are shifting against the war, that you felt an increasing state repression against the wrong kind of protester. You know, you write that Frank is stereotyped as symbol of the wrong kind of dissent. I was really struck by this. I live in South Minneapolis. I was present at a lot of the protests after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I saw kind of in real time the way that good press, good protester and bad protester are narrativized, mm -hmm. right? And the language of riot 
or is it an uprising or is it civil unrest? These are all different qualitative things. And as I've been thinking about how they're actually all in service of increasing criminalization, increasing repression around certain kinds of radical dissent. I was wondering if you could speak to your experience as someone who was repressed in that way and was made a symbol and how you've seen that play out, um, how the state controlling that narrative actually subdues solidarity within protest movements. Um, I think that's probably the end of my time. I just wanna thank you for this book. I really appreciate it, how it kind of blends fiction and your own life um, and this really personal is really political. And yeah, thank you so much. Charlotte, thank you. Thank you very much. Fran, that's going to take you several days to read yes, those, really those questions, <laughs> which I, I would be right. time well spent. Um, <laughs> Sid, please. Would it, would it be preferable to give um, Fran a couple moments to answer the questions, or should I, or should I begin? No, I think we should pile on the questions, and then Fran will sort <laughs> through and... So go right ahead, Sid, please. Yeah. So again, I am person to admit here. I am incredibly thankful for both like having this book and getting a chance to read it, and for the fact that we have events like this con continuing even in the even in the most difficult times. Like I had a lot a lot of fun reading this book for a, for a lot for a lot of different reasons, especially because um I, I feel like, a, like certain portions of it even like um, poked poked fun at myself and the difficulties of like being an organizer on campus and like work and thinking about all of the different people and organizations and groups that you have to deal with and the occasional like genuine drudgery even in the, even the sheer joy of resistance and I thought that was just on a very individual and basic level um, point so I have I have two big questions the first, the first one is generally is a, is about the references. I think one of the things that makes this book so like so particularly interesting and quite frankly, kind of a one of one of a kind work is that like it very deliberately, in my opinion, you've you've sought to kind of like blend like a traditional like um, like novelized narrative with a lot of like very intentional intentional references to um, theory, French intellectuals, philosophy, American intellectuals, Amer um, American feminist feminist writers, in what feels like a very like intentional and deliberate way through the character, the character of Frank. Over, like at the at the beginning of the book, when I was first like e exposed to this particular style, I was conf I was confused. But as I kept reading, it seemed to be like a much more almost like accurate way of of talking about like a lot of the a lot of the ideas that you wanted to put forward in a way that felt um like very deliberately unsubtle and 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 helpful and i think that was that was particularly good and especially with regards to thinking about camus and violence secondly i am very interested in in the choice of tolkien as like um, as a particular response, because one of the things that like I have I've been doing in terms of like um, just what what culture I've been consuming as of late is um, I have not been reading or watching The Lord of the Rings, but I have been going through and rewatching re all of the Star Wars movies, ah. which <laughs> um, which are according to many people, although this hasn't been fully cor corroborated and confirmed. Star Wars, the original movies by George Lucas are very deliberately about the Vietnam War. And that like his, me his method of like very powerful and robust world building, just like to Tolkien's world building was intended to serve as a place where lots of different political allegories could be grafted upon. And as we know, like in decades and decades of Star Wars content, some good and some bad, lots lots of different allegories have been made about American and global politics. And like, I'm wondering if you equally saw Tolkien's works as like gigantic, gigantic fantasy, fantasy worlds where anything and everything can and has taken place as like equally powerful slates for this type of allegory, as I often think about Star Wars a lot. 
Um, and my second and shorter question is mostly mostly about like the book as as a sort of guidebook. Is that like when you were writing this, did you ever did you ever see this book as some sort of like guide for um, future actors or um, future um, activists? Like you could say in our fight against well capitalism oppression imperialism and like trying to like provide a human face to the kind of advice and information that a book like this could have even even 50 even 50 years later is that something that was going through your head as as you built this built this and did it like affect any of your creative or authorial decisions at any point I would say those are, those are my two questions. Again, I'm incredibly thankful um, for, for this work and how it has made me think about my own activism on campus and what it, what it means to be a student of American studies, honestly, and why I think that is um, both a very important field of pursuit and a, and a mode of thinking about the world that surrounds us. And I couldn't thank you more. Thank you, Sid. So Fran, are you ready to share some thoughts in response to questions that Bill and Charlotte and Sid have raised? Yeah. And <laughs> after you've done that, Fran, we'll open up for uh, audience members to type in comments and questions as well. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, to Bill and, and Charlotte and Sid um, for your contributions. Uh, I am really humbled by um, how kind you've been to me <laughs> about this uh, foray into fiction, or what I like to actually call historical faction. Um, that it's a blending, as uh, I think you pointed out, you know, that it is intrusive, that I deliberately wanted uh, to try to capture the sense that while this character, uh, Franklin Roosevelt Goodman, a sort of semi-autobiographical character, is wending his way through this particular journey, uh, constantly being reminded of what's going on in the war. And uh, I wanted that as, as, as pointedly um, and mostly because of the lack of capacity that I have as a, as a fictional writer, I wanted it to be at least prosaically represented. There's that scene where he comes onto campus for the first time on the first day, the first day of classes, and you know, here's this bucolic setting, and then the next thing, the you know, I refer to is these 19-year-old kids slogging it out in the jungles of Vietnam, um, directly sort of taking that from Christian Appy's um, Working Class War and trying to make clear what's going on, what, what, what the experience of this generation is. Um, so let me try to return to the specific, some, some of the specific questions because they're, they're really, and, and, and Charlotte, you laid out <laughs> questions that I'm, I wanna, I, I'm gonna have to now sit down and write something about this, obviously. But yes, you're right. Um, the whole issue of nonviolence is, was really important to me, still remains important to me, um, you know, over, all these years, I've been arrested a number of times in nonviolent demonstrations, in whether it was for witness for peace, uh, going to Nicaragua, um, you know, uh, the um, nuclear freeze stuff, uh, protesting at uh, a cruise missile factory. I mean, all of that has been still a large part of my life. Um, that's been a, a, a major thread. And wrestling with that issue, particularly during the period of, um, of the late 60s, um, in the aftermath of the insurgencies, the murders of um, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, and by the police. I mean, it was really hard. That was a, a, a pool that you could hear the slogans, you know, um, the revolution, as the Panthers used to say, the revolution has come, time to pick up the gun. And I could never say that without feeling like I was being a little inauthentic <laughs> because I never felt like that was something I could personally do. Um, and yet I understood why people would feel compelled 
to meet state violence with defensive violence on their part. Um, so that kind of choreography, that sense of the dance that uh, Frank uh, tries to navigate in the novel is very much part of what I constantly wrestled with, which is why I, I think as, as Sid pointed out that um, Camus remains a constant for me. I, I mean, I just wrote this article for the Fifth Estate on solidarity in the plague um, and trying to better understand again how we connect, uh, how we remain, uh, as uh, Camus would say, uh, altruists, even as we commit to the kind of individualist rebe individual rebellion that provides our life with meaning. Um, so um, there's that. And the problem, as you also raise Charlotte, about where does that tip over into the sense of martyrdom? Um, and that was a that was a constant. That was a constant in my relationship with with Peggy, uh, the Mary Brown character. Um, it was very difficult to, to uh, not be constantly drawn into the sense that you had to be there in the protest. You couldn't absent yourself. The notion that somehow you could find a balance in your life to take time and relax um, wasn't as evident. So the whole issue of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, believe me, first time I smoked marijuana was at the, at the Pentagon demonstration. I mean, I, I wasn't, I was never into, uh, into drugs, um, you know, and I wanted to make also Frank a flawed character because I believe that I was a flawed character and remain a flawed character. Um, but so that whole issue of fidelity uh, in a relationship, the difficulty of sustaining that fidelity in a relationship, I think that that is compounded by the pools that one feels uh, both in personal terms and in political terms uh, at, that, at that particular time. And yeah, as you said, this male dominated um, draft resistance movement, and there were women who were certainly participated you know, in, in part of that, but I wanted to underscore what I point out in the novel when Eileen Penny or Ellen Pence, um, a great radical feminist in, in her own right, what, what she says uh, that this whole slogan of girls say yes to boys who say no makes me want to puke. And it always felt terrible to me too, to have to use that as a, as a slogan somehow. Um, um, so that, um, and I wanted to carry that forward in terms of, uh, of the feminist sensibility uh, in this novel. But yeah, I, I think of, and I've written about in extensive ways, the whole idea of a kind of alternative masculinism. Uh, I use this particularly in discussions of the IWW and the way that men formed a particular uh, alternative masculinist um, pro uh, protest movement. Um, so um, those are all, and finally, let me just end on this discussion of Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien, um, and I, 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 excuse, I'm sorry, I apologize to um, Dave Gutnecht, uh, who becomes Dan Whitman, uh, the Legolas character, the elf, um, uh, Dave Pence, the Jim Penny character, Gimli, the dwarf, uh, John Ryder, Aragon, Bill Tilton, uh, and uh, Sandy Wilkinson, Frodo, Fred Adamson. Um, these characters who are inflected with the Tolkien all as part of a quest. And the quest here is confronting the evil of the dominant system. And sometimes even that system, because you seek some way of confronting it, you're lured by the power, <laughs> just as Frodo was with the ring. And it, and it was interesting over time, I hadn't intended this. And sometimes when you're writing, um, you know, Sid, I, I never thought of this as a guide for present day activists, but it was amazing the kind of, uh, uh, you know, chance occurrence. It turned out that, that this um, site, this uh, missile site in North Dakota was in fact called Mount Doom, w related to the Mount Doom <laughs> in, in uh, Tolkien. So it just, you know, it just sort of happened by chance that that could work out and it became another way of expressing 
a layer of, of, of literary illusion, which I thought for people who were fans of Tolkien might provide some relief. Um, but uh, perhaps that's um, all I wanna talk about now. Uh, I, I do thank uh, all of you again. Sid, I'm glad you caught that. I mean, uh, th I'm trying to recreate to me what was one of my real passions at that time as a grad student, which was these ideas and, and how those ideas um, even you know, later on would become important, like the book by Shulamith Firestone, The Dialectic of Sex, which uh, you know, was a, a, a something we all had to read at that time and something that becomes part and parcel of Marge Piercy's book, Women on the Edge of Time, one of my favorite novels of all time. So I play around with that and try to make those links. And, um, and again, thank you. And I look forward to all of the, the comments and I look forward to actually seeing um, the punim, as we say in Yiddish, <laughs> of uh, Barry, Howie, uh, Danny, whoever else is uh, on, this, uh, on the call. Great, thank, thank you, Fran. Um, so um, I wanna encourage you to type in uh, questions and comments, uh, either directly for Fran or in response to the questions that have already been raised. Um, there's one question that's come in already. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna try to con read the comments or questions. We'll see if how that works. Um, one has come in already from uh, Kristen I. Tollefson. Um, Fran, did you struggle with the question, which I did, whether to concentrate your energies on international issues versus domestic issues? Um, I joined VISTA and worked as a community organizer uh, in Pittsburgh. Wow. So, Fran? Yeah, um, that's interesting. Uh, uh, there's a Pittsburgh connection, obviously, um, but uh, yeah, those are sort of things that I that I do try to wrestle with. I mean, I always felt that uh, part of what made the new left that I considered myself part of important was our ability to take on the issue of imperialism, our ability to understand as best we could uh, without going off the deep end. And I, uh, and by deep end, I mean what happened to the weather, weathermen and weather people. Um, and I'm so glad that I had my first daughter, Molly, in 1969. Um, that, to some extent, saved me. Um, being a parent saved me. Um, because you're faced with this quotidian responsibility. You have another human being that you're very, very responsible for. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I, I've never let go of what it means to be responsible for those who are the victims of our foreign policy, which continued to be the case um, around the globe. So trying to, in a way, find uh, that balance, again, between being an internationalist while not uh, foregoing the fact that we're talking to our fellow citizens about how we make change in our lives here in this country. That's, that's of course, a, a, a constant also. And so, you know, I, I found that and tried to discuss that at some length in the novel. And I hope that's fairly represented, even at the point at which I fictionalized the program that I actually taught in called the um, Higher Education for Lower Income People, and I made it the Higher Education for Poor People, HEP, and it was made up of uh, predominantly African-American women who were, you know, forefront of this struggle, particularly in the National Welfare Rights Organization, and I always wanted to have, again, a sense that um, these are the kinds of commitments we need to keep in our mind if we're continuing to build a multiracial, a multi-class uh, democratic insurgency. So um, as I'm waiting to see if more questions come in, um, I'm gonna throw one at you, Fran. 
Uh, this last week, I had the opportunity to uh, interview Carolyn Sue Olson, who's a visual artist uh, based in Duluth, who's done a magnificent series of pastels about essential workers. Mm. And two of her, her two children are both essential workers. Mm. And part of our conversation was my probing. So what do your children say about the art? So uh, I'm curious, Fran, you started today by saying you have three daughters who are feminists of, of, of different stripes uh, each. Mm -hmm. um, have they read the book? And, and what have they said? What sort of conversations have you had with them yeah. due to the book? Well, first, first and foremost, my oldest, Molly, uh, who was born uh, on Ju July 20th, 1969, the day the men landed on the moon, um, so uh, she helped me immensely in crafting the whole section about Ruth Brown's role as a um, director of a woman's shelter. Molly was an assistant director of a woman's shelter in Battle Creek, uh, not in, and I make the, the name of that was Safe. I changed it to Save in the novel and moved it to Jackson, uh, Michigan. Uh, so Molly really helped me craft that whole section of what it meant to run a woman's shelter, who the women were who came to that. Um, and, for, you know, I'm particularly appreciative of Molly for that. Um, my youngest, Emma slash Finn, has, uh, was the one who was the kickboxer, um, the, um, who, uh, you know, whose life in high school I sort of took over in the novel for uh, Ruth because she was, uh, she did fall for a, a goth skateboarder woman in high school. Uh, and, you know, and so I, I used some of that and we, we talked about it. I talked about um, the way that uh, she now, they now feel about what has become this gender blending. Um, so that tried, tried to make that in finally, uh, Miriam, my middle daughter, is the one who went to the University of Michigan, took a couple of courses, not with Catherine McKinnon, with other feminist faculty there, um, very much, uh, uh, and the one who has uh, told me that she finds uh, her, in reading this novel, uh, she feels sorry for Frank that he's going through all of this, which I thought was typical of my middle daughter for, uh, for her. Uh, comments about that. But I must say something that I didn't realize. I mean, all of the characters, the women, many of the women characters have actually the middle names of uh, Molly Ann is uh, the lover of Ruth uh, Brown, Mir Miriam Ruth, Emma Simone. Simone is the Simone Goodman Brown. Um, and I didn't know this until later, but I was trying to capture that generational um, thread. And so we've got Frank with the initial F, first name, Ruth with the initial R, and Simone with the initial S. And those are my initials, Francis Robert Shore. I was not conscious of that at all. It was one of those, one of those things. So I, I think, you know, the, my three daughters have been inspirations for me. They have been a resource material for me uh, for this novel. And for that, I'm uh, very appreciative. And they've also uh, brought me up on occasion uh, by uh, chastising me uh, for uh, certain, let's say, uh, 60 sensibilities that don't always carry over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, clearly, your unconscious was working mm -hmm. along, along with your conscious mind. Um, as any good novelist would. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, Chuck Turchik has asked um, that as, he, as Bill put it, we did shit, uh, but the war went on and on. Uh, where do you think that uh, your, our uh, anti-war and draft resistance was inadequate? Uh, what should we have done differently? Wow. Um, thanks, Chuck, and, and thank you to Bill and Chuck and uh, others who are in here. I never really got the chance of just admire, telling each of you how much I admire the fact that you uh, 
um, you know, had to deal with a lengthy um, prison sentence, something that I, I managed to uh, escape because of the good neck case. Um, and uh, although that, you know, certainly prepared and in, the, in the novel that uh, Frank and uh, Mary go up to Sandstone, which is where I thought we were gonna, I was gonna be sent, but any, I was fortunate, lucky throughout most of this. Um, so where did, where did we, where were we um, not, didn't measure up as much? I think, is that the question or where yeah. could we have, you know, I, I think something that happened, there's a that little exchange between uh, Vince and Frank about where Vince uh, Bourgeois, the uh, lawyer um, who ch chastises uh, Frank for playing in the sandbox, you know, uh, just uh, staying on college campuses. Um, it was difficult to reach out. Bill, you remember this. When we graduated, when we had our mock graduation ceremony in 1970, we basically turned, we, we organized a community effort to reach out to people uh, in Minneapolis and to begin to do organizing uh, around anti-war work. And I always thought, uh, you know, the difficulty of doing that, the difficulty of reaching out to communities uh, of not like-minded people uh, meant that we had to learn uh, a kind of repertoire that we always weren't prepared to, prepared to take on. Like, how do we talk to, you know, working class people uh, as a middle class uh, student? Um, you know, how do we deal with those kinds of issues? And, and that was a real item, you know, in dealing with the labor committee with the Honeywell project, which I was on. And, you know, we had that meeting and the Teamsters show up to try to beat our heads in. I mean, I was, you know, how I think we could have there were ways that we missed opportunities in reaching out to the labor movement at the time, even though there's that great book uh, by on hard hats, Hawks, and uh, you, you probably know the book. Penny uh, Lewis's uh, book. Yeah, Penny Lewis's yeah. book about the fact that working class people were animated, were engaged, were anti-war, um, but how we organized to feel like we could be part and parcel of this. And to go back, Charlotte, to your, to your point, I mean, that we uh, sometimes saw ourselves as righteous dissenters uh, who didn't want to, uh, you know, somehow sully ourselves by by going outside the of the of our bubble, going outside of our comfort zone, and what that might mean, uh, and how it meant uh, digging in more uh, to 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 living in these communities. So I always admired community organizers who would work for years on end, uh, you know, and, and tough it out. And I, uh, I, I, um, and I always sort of thought of myself as a community organizer on campus, uh, which was a safer area to work at. Um, so Chuck, more specifically, you know, reaching out, making those bridges, creating a situation so that those people um, in working class communities wouldn't, did, would not see us somehow as the enemy that then uh, continued to be, uh, as it continued to be represented in the press. And even more recently um, in um, the PBS documentary mm. about Vietnam, where the peace movement is relegated uh, to, you know, these, um, uh, to a, sort of a footnote without, um, you know, without understanding its full range um, so yeah, there were there were missed opportunities. There were problems that we had in terms of our own inadequacies, and problems that uh, I think anybody faces in how you build a multi-class, multi-racial, um, you know, alliance. I mean, it, it one of the reasons that I'm a little bit hopeful about what's happening is when I think about the march on Washington. Those young kids, they didn't even have to. It wasn't. It was like second nature to them already to reach out, to, to know that it had to be multiracial, to just know that it was it was gonna be that way. Uh, you know, it wasn't as if there were, it was automatic and spontaneous, they had to do the work, um, but it became sometimes a little difficult for us to always do that work um, back in the, in the 60s or 70s. 
So let me, I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair to ask one more question and then I wanna open this up wide um, for, for whatever visiting and comments you all wanna make. Um, along the lines, Fran, of the, the question of getting outside the bubble of, of interacting with the labor movement and working class folks and building multiracial alliances and relationships. Um, almost two years ago, we celebrated um, at the Eastside Freedom Library and with people at the University of Minnesota, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Black student takeover uh, of Morrill Hall. And, um, and I wonder, so what is the relationship of what's happening uh, with African-American students at the U and their own activism um, and the seemingly synchronous activism that's going on on the part of the anti-war movement? Is there communication? Are there connections? Is there solidarity? Um, is this a East Bank versus West Bank kind of uh, movement? Um, what can you say about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd invite others also to talk about this. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to end this at, uh, at 1970, even though I was still in uh, grad school in, in Minneapolis um, in, through 1972. Um, and I, uh, but by, 19, by 1969 with a kid in 1971, my second kid, you know, there were different things that we were taking on in terms of, of community movements and um, uh, building co-ops and stuff like that. Um, yeah, there was, uh, there clearly was a movement both within, um, and here other people can talk about it, within, within South Minneapolis and North Minneapolis with African-Americans who were organizing in both of those neighborhoods in the late 60s and early 70s. On campus, somebody can remember Anna, Anna, do you remember what Anna's last name was, Bill? Uh, yes, Anna Stanley. Anna Stanley. I, I, I'm living in the house where she lived. Oh my God. With Mary Kowalski for years. Yes, yeah. I, so, I, I own that house now. And, and she and Mary used to own it before me. So Anna Stanley was this force of nature, was just this, this incredible force, I think, that, that um, was able to articulate some of those demands that were going on on campus um, and uh, that was part and parcel, I imagine, of what the Morrill Hall takeover was, um, you know. Um, so, uh, but there was, there, there still, of course, were, were frictions, uh, frictions between um, the various movements. Um, sometimes uh, the, Chicano movement. Remember Roy Ro uh, Ray Robles. Ray uh, Ray Roybal. Ray Roybal. Yeah. So there were all of these people who were the kind of articulate spokespeople for the um, what was going on with the movement, the Chicano movement, uh, the movement of Black liberation, um, the movement, the American Indian movement, uh, which was which was very important and which I try to talk a little bit about um, in the novel. Um, uh, I, I think others may be able to talk with more insight about what was going on then post 1970 uh, on campus. Um, and, uh, you know, with some of these movements, Pete, that, that uh, particularly the, the Black liberation struggle and that Morrill Hall uh, takeover. Bill, you might have a lot more to say about it than I recall. If Bill, go please, go ahead. If I might, I, I stayed in touch with many of the leaders of the African-American Action Committee, which was the name of the Black Student Union mm -hmm. of its day. Um, um, uh, its president, uh, Rose Freeman, who became Rose Freeman yeah. Massey, uh, right. became a, a very dear friend. To a person, the leadership of that organization walked their talk. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the, the purpose of the sit-in at, at the Bursar's office in Morrow Hall in January of 1969 was, was to get attention and to get a, a African-American studies department. Right. They didn't take over the entirety of Morrow Hall. They took over just the Bursar's office. They let President Moose come and go to his own office. It was one <laughs> of the most surgical, short, and successful sit-ins of that era. It was brilliant. And, and Anna Stanley, so they, they that same year get, got the university to create an African-American, African studies department. John Wright, who had been, uh, I think in mechanical engineering uh, and was about to graduate, switched his major and majored in African-American studies and taught for his entire career at the University of Minnesota. He's emeritus now. He's one of the smartest people and best speakers that I know. Um, uh, um, Rose Freeman uh, Massey got her degree in African-American studies and taught her entire career at the Milwaukee Area Technical College. I, I can brag whenever she came to the Twin Cities for organizing meetings, she stayed at my house. She was an adopted member of, of Ken Tilson's family. Ken yeah. Tilson yeah. was uh, the lawyer who became my father figure. Um, and, and has a, a wonderful uh, 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 generations of his progeny around. Um, Horace Huntley, who uh, uh, was, was a sort of uh, uh, Rose's second in command and consigliere, got his degree in African-American studies, has taught his entire career. He went back to Birmingham, Alabama, where he's from. He taught at the university, he's emeritus now, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, uh, Anna Stanley was always an artist. She became a very, very strong uh, uh, leader in, in the gay rights uh, uh, feminist movement. Uh, like I say, she lived in my, my house. She and Mary Kowalski owned this house. Um, um, I, I, I'm forgetting uh, Dr. Woods, Manuel Woods, um, uh, stayed in academia. I, I, I can keep going down the list, but yeah. I don't want to take it over. Um, but but I have these are my heroes and and Dave Gutnick and Chuck Kerchick and other people involved in this group are some of my heroes um, uh, that I'm privileged to say I, I I got to know better. It's not like we knew each other that well back then. But but uh, these people are people that I was privileged to stay in touch with, and they uh, uh, are about to a person walked the talk yeah. and, and, and provided so much leadership for other people. Uh, we were lucky to have been part of that. Right. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill.